Good afternoon to everyone under the sound of my voice. I welcome you to Mana Ministries, founded by my parents, uh, Patrick Sims, Evangelist Patrick Sims, my wonderful mother, and the late Bishop Ken Sims, uh, my wonderful father. My name is Camelia Watson, and I am an integral, integral part of Mana Ministries. I mostly a behind the scenes person. I am a prayer warrior and intercessor. However, there are times when I come to the forefront to deliver a word from the Lord. So here I am. When I was asked to minister, I went into the presence of the Lord to inquire about the subject matter. That's very important to me to be prompted by the Holy Spirit, because I want to be sure that I hear the heartbeat of the Lord for whatever audience I am going to be ministering to. So once in the presence of the Lord, I clearly heard in my spirit, are you awake? So that's the title of today's message. Are you awake? When I ask the question, are you awake? I'm not referring to the concept of wokeness, which refers to the agendas of the world, awareness of inequalities as it relates to um, race and sexism, LGBTQ, all of those issues that fall under that. That's the world's idea of what it means to be woke. As saints of God, the word tells us that we are in this world but not of this world. And I realize that not everybody may be a saint of God, but we'll get into that a little bit uh, later as well. But the question that I pose to you today, are you awake, refers to the spiritual state of being awake. Now in the Bible, spiritual awakening refers to a resurrection from a spiritual death into spiritual life or light, if you will, out of the darkness and into the light. I want to go ahead and start with my key scripture, which is going to be Ephesians 5, 14, and I will touch on it later, but I want to preface this whole thing with my key scripture. And it says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. The Hebrew word for awake is alim yakvatin. I'm sorry, I lost my place for a second. And it means to rouse from sleep. Now, why is it important to incorporate other languages? Well, the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew and even some Arabic, but oftentimes the English definition of a word doesn't give it the full intensity of the meaning. So arouse from sleep, rouse from sleep. And then I also looked up the Hebrew word for dead, and it is mowaktuv, meaning to die. Death in a spiritual sense is a progression. It doesn't happen overnight. And this is the wrong day and age to live in, to be spiritually asleep, if you will. You can't watch if you're not awake. What do I mean by that? First of all, you can't be awake if you have not put off the old man. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, look, all things have become new. Well, you might say, how do I put off the old man? Romans 10.9 and 10 states that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he's been raised from the dead, then you are saved. Now, it's just that simple. However, more is entailed. There's more to that process, but that's the first step, inviting Christ into your heart, because if Christ is not in your heart, you will never be awake, even if your eyes are open. So that's a way for you to come into the light. There's no way around that. There's no middle ground. You can't work your way into heaven no amount of Hail Marys will save your soul. New age practices won't do it. No claims of being spiritual. Scientology, 
third eye practices representing mystical intuition and insight and enlightenment beyond what the physical eye can see. If you want to go beyond the, the, what the physical eye can see, you first have to give your life to Christ and then the Holy Spirit is housed in you and he will begin to unveil some things. How do I know? Well, I was once in the world myself and it is a journey. It is a process. The closer you grow in, in Christ, the more you become spiritually aware, spiritually awake. So again, he's the only way you can't do it with the sixth sense. Clairvoyance won't do it or any of those things. And I'm not being judgmental. I'm not being critical of the world because the world is being drawn to all of these avenues because we were created with an inner void that was meant only to be filled by Jesus Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit, because he is the only way to God the Father. I looked up the word religion because in our culture today, we often hear, you know, what religion are you? Um, but so the English definition in Webster's Dictionary of religion is a belief in and worship of a superhuman power or powers, a God or gods. Well, I beg to differ with that definition, and it is my right, so I'm taking advantage of that. He's not a God. He is the one and true living God, and all those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The, the Bible tells us that, and he's not just a God with power or powers, he holds all the power in his hands. And that is good news today that we serve a God. If you are in the kingdom, you serve a God who holds all power in his hand. And, and some people may be listening and thinking, OK, well, if he holds all power, what is going on in the world today? I'm glad you asked, because the thing is, is when you come to Christ, you are a free willed agent. You're doing it because you realize, look, I've come to the end of myself. There's got to be a better way. I've tried Buddhism. I've tried Hinduism. I've tried being a Muslim. All those things that we try and there's still that void. There's a reason for that. And it's because Jesus Christ is the only one to feel that. Saying you know God is not enough because he says... I don't know you if you don't look like my son. And the good news is that he sent his son to die for our sin. And I'm going to go ahead and finish this thought so you can be refreshed. We'll be back in just a few moments and I will continue that thought. Okay, we're back fast. So I'm going to continue that thought. So he's made a way for us to come to himself through his son because when he sees me, I'm not a perfect being, nor will I ever be. But thank God, when I go into the presence of the Lord and he sees me, what he sees is his son, that blood that he shed for me. And I now have a right to go into his presence freely. Thank God for that. We can't make it to heaven through any other name other than the name of Jesus Christ. So when you get to the bare bones of religion, if Jesus Christ isn't your Lord and Savior, there's no making it into heaven, no matter what religion you are. I'm sorry. I don't know what you've been told all of your life, but I'm here to tell you. I'm here to change uh, that mindset of you can enter in however you want. No, you can't. Christ purchased our lives. We are all creation of Christ, but we are not all of God's children. So if you haven't accepted it into accepted him into your heart, you are not yet his child and you want to come into the fold. So being awake in Christ is a daily process that requires maintenance. But when you accept Christ into your heart, the Holy Spirit is then housed in you and he becomes your helper. John 14 and 26 says in the Bible, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. And this is Jesus here responding to a question uh, that one of the disciples had asked him, Lord, how what signs are we going to have when you go? How are we going to know that you're with us? And he said, the 
the, I, I will, my father will send the Holy Spirit in my name and he's going to teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. And the Holy Spirit is also referred to as the comforter. He is a comforter. He's a counselor. He's an intercessor. He's your advocate, your strengthener, your standby man. Listen, I'm telling you, that is a good package to know that I have access to a father in heaven that is right here housed on the inside of me. And I'm not talking about what I hear. I promise I'm not sitting before you telling you something that sounds good just because my mom and my dad were pastors. I had to give my life to Christ for myself. And I have gotten to know him. And he is a wonderful father. And he has been all of those things to me. So as I look around at the world today, we're living in unprecedented times of devastation and destruction. Evil is being called good. Good is being called evil. The Supreme Court just voted last week five to four to reject a Biden administration emergency request. Now, when I hear emergency request, I'm thinking state of emergency. What the world deems as an emergency, it was an emergency request that would have allowed biological men all over the United States to enter into women's locker rooms, dressing rooms, and dorms. That's an emergency, according to the world. But guys, let me tell you, we are in a state of emergency. It's called our souls. And I'm here to, to testify about the goodness of the Lord. And no, you're not gonna experience, you're gonna experience life as a Christian too. People that say you come to Christ and everything is always A-OK, -okay. you experience happiness all the time. No, but you can have peace all of the time, that peace that lives on the inside of you. So I'm looking and I'm searching, who can I help? Who can I minister to? Who can I witness to? Are you awake? I see an indication that it's time for us to go on another break. So I will continue after these moments. Please stay with us. Welcome back. So are you awake? That's the question. Just a minute ago, I mentioned earlier a spiritual awakening as a resurrection from a spiritual death. Let's look at Ephesians 2 and 1. And it reads, and you who he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, this was Paul addressing a church in Ephesians. He had written a letter. He was in prison, but he was reminding and encouraging the body of Christ, admonishing them. This is what God did for you. He saved you from all of these things. He, he brought you over from death to life. You are now a saint. And so he's saying, remember, I'm encouraging you. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you. He's giving them practicalities, things not to do as followers of Christ to help them grow in their spiritual knowledge of God. And he's also encouraging the saints to withstand the powers of evil. So what did that look like? Well, I'm going to read Ephesians 5, 1 through 5, and then I'll skip over to 14 and I'll read 14, 15, 16. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And you can only do this when you've come into a relationship with Christ. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So I've got to take myself into the presence of the Lord on a daily basis to ask him to wash me, cleanse me. And I do that through prayer, through confession and through the reading of the word, because he is his word and his word is direction to me in my life. And he says, but fornication and all uncleanness of, and or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. Among the saints, don't let this be named among you as it is fitting for saints. 
neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And when they talk about, you know, coarse jesting and all of those things, we're talking about vulgarity, you know, and, and I don't have to go into all of that. You know what that sounds like. That is not fitting for the saints. He said, for this, you know, that no fornicator unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater, anything that we put before Christ, I don't care what it is, food, TV, family, friends, if it comes before Christ, then it is an idol. Now, I'm not saying don't spend time with people, so don't hear what I'm not saying, but if you can't spend time with Christ, something in your life and in my life has become an idol. So it says, as saints, it's not fitting. And none of those things have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And I'm going to jump over now and read verse 14 again, which was my key uh, verse for the message I prefaced at the beginning. Paul is saying, reminding the saints, therefore, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Light is only in Christ. You can only be a light when you're in Christ. Now you can do good, but even our good, God says, hey, you know, no man is good. I cannot be good in and of myself. I need the help of the Holy Spirit. And he said, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Well, what does that mean to walk circumspectly? Walk with care. People are watching you. The world is watching us as saints. Then it says redeeming the time. Why? Because we are living in the last days. We don't have a lot of time left. Now, I don't know how long we have, but I know I don't want to play Russian roulette with my soul. He could pierce the sky any time to rapture his church out. Are you going to be ready? I'm going to be ready. And I say that in the power of the Holy Ghost because he gives me strength every day to walk circumspect, to walk circumspect, spectly. <laughs> that means people are watching my life. And I'll tell you this, the world can look at the church now and they can do whatever, but they will look at us. When you say I am a Christian, a follower of Christ, and they see you doing something wrong, they will gladly look at you and say, hey, wait a minute. You're not supposed to look like that. You said you were a Christian. You said you were a follower of Christ. So that is one of the reasons why I need to make sure that I walk circumspectly. I'm not perfect. I will never be perfect. But I'm striving toward the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what he calls us to do. Be imitators of him. A compromised life is a bad reflection on the body of Christ. Why? I said it earlier. The world is watching us. We may be the only walking, living Bible that anybody in the world, in our environment, wherever you work, your home, your little sphere of influence, you may be the only Bible that people see. Don't cause the word of God to, to suffer reproach. That's We do things to grieve the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to do that because he sent his son to give his life for us so that we have access to him. And I want people to say, if being a Christian looks like that with all of my faults, with all of my flaws, all of my mistakes, I want to still be able to compel people to Christ. It's OK to say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. God's not looking for a perfect people. And if he was, guess what? I wouldn't be sitting here before you now ministering anything because I would not be a candidate, but he uses messed up people. You can't clean yourself up. You have to first come to Christ and then he, through that process, getting in the word, in prayer, surrounding yourself with people of like faith, you begin to grow in the Lord and come as you are. You know, I know uh, uh, some people who came to Christ and immediately they stopped doing whatever it was. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't always work like that. Come as you are. Allow the Holy Spirit to help you clean up your life. You can't do it. I can't do it. He is the helper. Only he can do it. So that's why we don't want to live compromised lives. It's a poor reflection of what God has called us to be as saints. He called us to be holy, set apart. We live in this world, yes. 
we can enjoy things. I'm not saying, you know, be rigid. People don't want to come to Christ and we can't do anything. You can't, and you can't enjoy and have a good time. Yes. But our enjoyment should look different from the world. And if it doesn't, then we need to start questioning, hmm, am I not going into the presence of the Lord, being cleansed? What habits and hangups and hideouts and miseries, as my dad used to call them, have I allowed to create cobwebs in my life? And that's important. I've been saved for 28 years. I'm 44 years old. I mentioned earlier, my mom and my dad were pastors. I was raised in a Christian home, but I did not. I had to come to a point in my life. I was 18 years old and I had to recommit. My parents committed me to the Lord, but them being saved didn't make me safe. I had to confess with my own mouth and I believed in my heart that Jesus was Lord, but I hadn't made the confession at that age because age of accountability comes when you know. And I said, okay, some things are going on in my life and I have got to give my life over completely and utterly to the Lord. And I haven't been perfect since, but I'm a work in progress. And those that know me, those in my sphere of influence, when I go out, I'm being cognizant of the fact that I am supposed to be a light to the world. Why am I talking about this? The church is supposed to be a reflection. But I'll have to tell you, because the days are evil, the world can even tell us some stuff is going on. Things, people are being influenced by forces, spiritual forces that we can't see. And the church, sadly, is looking real bad. And again, I'm not being judgmental. I'm not being critical. I'm praying for those who have fallen. But if you watch any type of social media, you listen to the news, I know you have heard and you have seen mega churches where pastors are now being exposed. Listen, you can best believe that exposure didn't come overnight. God knocks and tugs at our heart and he's saying, hey, come into my presence. Get this right. You're treading on dangerous ground. Look, the more we practice sin, the easier it becomes to do it. And then you lie in that. I'm not saying I don't sin. I'm saying I don't practice sin. I'm not looking for those opportunities to, to just enter in and stay there and lay in fill. No, but the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So as a, as a believer, yes, I've fallen short. I'm not telling you I don't sin, but I get repentance and that is I repent and I get forgiveness. That is the difference between those who continue in a lifestyle of sin. You're not going to be perfect. I reiterate that. There are consequences and consequences are coming. We don't want to be caught when the window closes for the time to repent. And that is what has happened with these churches at these mega um with these pastors at these mega churches, they are now being exposed and it looks really, really bad. I'll be the first to say that. What do you say when people are saying, well, the pastor of that church, look at what he's been partaking in and he got caught. Yeah, he did. Don't let that be an excuse or they did or she did, whoever, and even local churches. It may not be broadcasted, but he's coming for all of us. So don't let that be your excuse to not enter into the family of God. You want to be engrafted in so that you can have a seat in heaven. And I'm going to stay. If you are already in, stay in because you want to meet your maker. Okay. The thing you and I don't know, I said it. You don't know when your window is closed. You want to be in the fold. Don't let another person's fall or other people's bad example of Christianity cost you your salvation. We have to be fully committed. That's going to look different for everybody. OK, you're not going to come in and automatically. You're at this point that takes time, that takes discipling. OK, so. They are pastors and preachers and teachers and evangelists. And you're going to grow in the things of God. Find a good church home where somebody is 
the pastor for sure, because people are people. But when you look at the head, if the head is not aligned, then you want to make sure you find a space. You want a pastor that is at least pursuing Christ with the best of his ability. And I will pick this up when we return. But let that thought resonate with you. Don't let somebody else's excuse be your excuse. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. So I'm going to pick up if we don't go into the presence of the Lord and get things right, repent and turn from my evil ways. We all know what evil ways look like. I know I know I used to live in it constantly and I got tired of that. There was no peace in that. And you can't tell me there is pleasure in sin for a season. But you can't tell me because I lived it going out getting drunk, getting high, don't know where you've been, don't know where you are when you wake up in the bed with people you never intended to get in the bed with. At a certain point in time, that is, it becomes exhausting and you become stripped of yourself. And that's what's called the death, dying a spiritual death. And we don't want to be like that in Christ. We want to make sure that we are living the lives that he has commissioned us to live. So again, don't suffer consequences for other people's actions and for our own actions. Are you awake to the truth that God is coming and he's going to judge us for the things that we have done? Most people don't fall away overnight. It's a process. And that's why we're seeing things in the news. When we don't do daily maintenance, the book of James and the word talks about we become enticed and we're drawn away of our own lust. And then that's when sin is producing. Sin ultimately produces spiritual death. Yes, but it can also produce physical death. You can think about all the things that we see in the news because somebody, you know, stepping out, sleeping with somebody else's husband. There are a lot of different reasons. God is not just saying don't do this and don't do that because he's a mean God. It's because he knows that at the end of the road, there is a devastating crash and he wants to help us avoid those things just like we do as good parents with our children we don't allow them to do every and anything just because they want to well mom i want to run out and play in the street well no you can't go and play in the street because if you play in the street you're gonna get hit by a car it's not a, a matter of if it's a matter of when and that is the same thing when we are living in sin and doing things that we are not supposed to do so fall if you fall get up but sit down and don't be telling other folk what to do when you're not doing all that you can to be all that God has called you to be sit down I had to do this allow God to work on you. First of all, repent and tell him to cleanse you because he will do it and then get back up. You don't have to stay down. And no matter what the world tells you, what people say, you get up because when you go to heaven, you got to stand before God for you, not for other people. And you continue. Now come out of that thing, but continue in the Lord and he will help you and refresh you because refreshing comes in times of it being in the presence of the Lord and reading his word. Daily maintenance is required. If I don't maintain my car, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to drive it until everything, the wheels fall off, the engine breaks down. If I don't do daily, not daily maintenance, but if I don't do um, consistent maintenance, that car is going to fall apart. If I don't put gas in my car, you know, consistently try to ride on your car, try to ride in your car on gas from last week. You're going to be sitting on the side of the road. And that's what happens when we don't do what the word tells us to do. This book right here is a map. It's directions for us to live our lives. And yes, it was inspired by God, written by man, but things that we see in this word, it applies to us right now, today. So don't be fooled. 
You want to know the, the future? Read this book right here. Read it. There are things in here that are already coming to pass. My mom does a, a session every Tuesday. She ministers and she's been on end time series and it's been some good stuff. But you don't want to miss heaven. You don't want to forfeit your soul. OK, don't make an exchange for something that makes you feel good in the moment. And then you lose your soul, because if you lose your soul, if I lose my soul salvation, I'm going to a place that was never intended for me. I'm going to hell. Hell was never intended for us, but we make decisions. Hell was intended for Satan, Lucifer then, Satan now, and all the falling angels. But God is a gentleman. He's not going to force you into anything but you make that choice. My mom said it on her program. You make the choice. Choose now who you're going to serve. You don't know if you're going to have breath tomorrow. You don't even know if you're going to wake up. What you have is the here and now. So don't wait until it's too late. God always has a remnant. So with all of the things that we see going on in the church that's on the news, God has a people that is praying. God has a people that is striving to be all that he is calling them to be and to be the light in the world. He always has a remnant. So no matter what's going on, God still has a people set aside for himself. And those people can still come to Christ, but I don't know when the too late is going to be. I'm not God. We have to get down on our knees in repentance, turn away from our sins. Again, if you partake in it on a consistent basis, it's hard to come out of it. So don't do it. We hear people say all of the time, what's the worst thing that can happen if I don't become a Christian? What is the worst thing that you can lose if you are not awake in Christ? I'll tell you, you lose eternity in heaven with him. So you're not, you're not awake if you don't know who you are. And to me, this is the saddest thing. There's so much confusion in the world around us. Gender confusion. Romans talks about men who burn in their lust for other men working that which is unseemly. That means the parts don't fit. But I have compassion and I have compassion because Jesus Christ has compassion. God has compassion for the lost. We love everybody, but we are to tell it like it is. If it's in the word, I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. If you are participating in that lifestyle, the Lord will help you come to him, ask him to clean you up and he'll shift those desires. I know people who used to be uh, in that group, the LGBTQ, and they have now given their lives over to the Lord and the Lord is helping them. He wants to help you, allow him to do that for you. Again, no judgment. This is me preaching, ministering love because God said we are to love and God is love. He loves you. And you want to know him as the God of love and the God of, of um you know, he's forgiven me of my sins. You don't want to meet him as your judge, because when we do that, if you do that, it is already too late. If you've met him as your judge, those books are open and he's just showing you a mirror of your entire life and all of the moments that you had to accept him because he said no man would lose his life without first having the opportunity to accept Christ. So don't lose that opportunity. OK, don't lose it. The Lord spoke to me earlier this year. Our, our family, Man of Ministry, um, participates in fasting. And that's a time at the beginning of the year where we get before the Lord and we ask him to give us spiritual clarity. And we ask for a renewal and a cleansing. And it's just I, I do enjoy those times at the beginning of the year. And we do it periodically throughout the year, too. But that time is so special to me because I get spiritual clarity all over again of where do I need to move from here, God? What do I need to do? What do I need to what's what clutter do I need to clean out of my life? But he spoke to me in my spirit and he said, there's going to be a rise in insanity. And I've seen it. We've seen it. People are being inundated with voices from the outside, voices that you don't even understand if you're not in Christ. Why am I being influenced? Why did I do that? I am a retired educator. 
And there were times in my classroom where I would ask my students, sweetheart, why did you do that? And they'll tell me, I don't even know. I don't know. And that's what's happening in this world. People don't understand why they're doing things. And it's because of all of those demonic influence. Listen, Satan fell like lightning. And I'll tell you, he's upset. He knew he knows where he's going and he is doing his best. He is doing all he can to take you with him. Don't allow him to do that. OK, this world is going to hell in a hand basket. And Satan is the one carrying people in the basket it straight to hell with him. You don't want to be in that basket. Hell implies destruction. So my mind can't fathom when I hear people saying, you know, yeah, well, when I'm partying now, when I get to hell, I'm going to keep on partying. No, if hell implies now destruction and ruin, you ever met somebody, uh, uh, you know, you accosted them and said, hey, how was your day? And they say, you know what? My day was hell. That's not a good thing. So why in the natural if somebody says, hey, my day was hell and we know, wow, you had a really bad day. Why do you think going to hell means party time? No, it's gnashing of teeth, weeping and welling and constant torture and flames that, again, were not meant for us. And so this is the time the Lord sent me. He said, snatch souls out of hell. And that's what I'm coming to do. My snow, my soul was snatching. I thank God that my mom and my dad laid a foundation so that I could build layers on top of that foundation because they can't stand before God for me. My dad is in heaven. I'll see him again because when you die in Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My sister is in heaven. I'll see her again because she was saved. So I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? Are you awake? The good news is that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, you're a whosoever, I'm a whosoever, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you've done. You are a whosoever. So whosoever believeth in him, accepting him, Christ, into your heart shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You want to have everlasting life, but you have to make a choice. Are you one of the ones who have fallen away? Are you one of the ones who have never given your life over to Christ? Are you one of those who would say, I go to church on Sundays? Well, demons go to church too. I know I've been in church services where they manifested themselves. And I've also been a part of the ministry team that was casting demons out. But you can't do that in your own strength. There's a passage in the Bible where men tried to do what the man of God was doing. And so we're going to go. I'll come back to this. We're going to take a few moments break. We're going to come back and I'll finish my thought. But please stay with us. Don't go anywhere. So again, we have to understand that if we haven't given our lives over to Christ, we've given them over to something else. And I know I keep saying this. I'm saying it on purpose. I'm reiterating. You've given your life over to something if you haven't given it over to Christ. There are only two forces in this world. Okay, two forces. And that's evil and that's light. That's good. And you are only in that if you are in Christ, the kingdom of darkness, darkness and the kingdom of light, two forces. The world is being influenced by darkness all around us. People are doing things that I would have never have dreamed that I would see or thought, not dreamed, I, that I would see in this day and age. People are doing all sorts of evil. They're being influenced by darkness. I promise you, I'm thinking about the opening of the Olympics in Paris. 
my God, and I didn't watch it, but I saw the news because I watch and pray as an intercessor, as a prayer warrior. I don't just watch things to, to comment and say, oh, wow, look at what's going on. That's really bad. No, I watch to pray. I watch to combat evil in this world. And when we speak, when we go into the throne room as intercessors, and as prayer warriors, the Lord hears his people. The word tells us that the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And it does. We haven't seen anything yet. And the world will not see anything until the church is raptured out. They won't see anything like they're going to see. When the church is raptured out and all those prayers stop and he's come to get his people, well, you're going to see a whole lot more of evil. I'm not going to be here. My hope for you is that you won't be here as well, but it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So if you're not awake, my friend, your soul is on death row. Get off of death row. Come into the light. Being saved is a process again, a journey that you take. The result of accepting Christ into your heart by faith is an immediate thing. The moment you open your mouth and say, I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior and all of those things that we've been talking about in this program, you are now saved. But the process is not the process of being saved happens instantaneously. But the process of growing and maturing in Christ takes time. There's a reward and the reward of that process comes. It's realized completely and fully when you stand before your maker, Jesus Christ. You've been raptured up into his presence. You can hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to hear those words and hopefully you want to hear those words as well. Again, you won't change overnight, but you have to come to the end of yourself. So I ask you again, are you awake? Invite Jesus into your heart. Let him be your savior and he will also be your helper. Get connected with the church that's teaching and preaching the word where the presence of the Lord is. If you walk into a stale, dead church, we're not supposed to look like funeral homes. I'm sorry, the God I serve, there's excitement. No, you're not supposed to be jumping off of chairs and acting crazy crazy. There's some churches that I've been in that go the opposite. And, and no, God is a God of order. So I'm not talking about things like that, but you need to be able to feel the presence of the Lord. You need to be able to sense conviction. If you're sitting in a church and you're comfortable in your sins, you're comfortable doing wrong deeds, you better get up and find you somewhere else to go and sit under a man of God that is following Christ to the best of his ability. Paul said it in several of the, the books of the Bible, Corinthians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, follow me as I follow Christ. If I stop following Christ, don't you follow anybody who's not following Christ. You continue to follow Christ until you are connected with somebody that you can follow again. Stay in your words, stay in prayer. And church is not necessarily the four walls. Yes, you go and you fellowship, but I fellowship on, on the phone with believers. We have, uh, you know, sometimes I, I enter into the prayer line conference with Apostle Hills, who is my spiritual uh, grandmother, and I fellowship with the believers that way. I get on Tuesdays sometimes when my mom is ministering, and although that's not me actively, you know, sharing with the body of Christ, I'm getting fed the word of God. And just because you teach or preach the word or minister, don't think you don't need it. I need it. You need it. We all need it. One of my favorite authors, is of course, Bishop Ken Sims, The Mystery of the Anointing. And my mother is one of my favorite authors, Patrick Sims. And she wrote Eyewitness, great books, by the way. Pick them up if you get a chance. Um, she goes into detail about that on Tuesdays. But Max Licato is also one of my favorite authors. And I do a daily devotional. We don't have an excuse anymore. We have telephones, technology at the press of a button, you version. You can choose the version of the Bible that makes sense to you. I prefer the King James and New King James version because that's what I grew up on. But we are to study the word and you learn how to study as you grow. But read a version that you can understand. It's not going to help you if you don't understand the these and the thou shouldest and all. Read a version that you can understand. 
and apply what you read to your heart. Apply it. Ask the Lord, hey, search me. Talk to him out loud. People think praying is, you know, um, I have to be fancy and philosophical. Uh, talk to Jesus, talk to God, I'm sorry, talk to God the same way that you would to somebody in your room. Hey, God, help me. I need your help. I can't do this by yourself. I There's some things that I'm dealing with and I'm struggling. Help me. He will help you. Whatever you need, he will be that for you. It's not going to be easy. You have to do some work. It's just like losing weight. You can't say, I want to lose weight. And then all of a sudden, pounds drop. You have to put in that effort. He will help you, but you also have to help yourself. Help yourself into his presence. Help yourself into the word of God. Help yourself into prayer. And as you continue into prayer, then those prayers deepen it. And it does become, I used to pray one minute prayers, 30 second prayers. I pray now sometimes an hour, two hours, but I grew into that. Again, I have been saved for 28 years. And you, when you become saved, as you are going through that process, you have a desire to look and be more like Christ and you grow. And as you hear the voice of the Lord, and you know your purpose, you know your identity in Christ, you begin operating in those things. And at first, it's just going to be, hey, let me tell my testimony. Let me tell you what the Lord delivered me from. I used to sleep around. I used to drink and get drunk and all of those things. The Bible says, don't be drunk with wine. Now, that applies to everything. Beer, all of, I'm, and I'm not suggesting you go out and drink, but I'm also not saying to drink is sinning, but it can lead to that. So for me, I used to have a glass of wine here and there, and I don't believe anything is wrong with that if you are a strong Christian in the Lord, if you're not predispositioned to alcoholism. But I would caution you, don't drink at all. I don't drink anymore. And I haven't drunk for years because you never know if you're that person that now I'm going to the bottle to find solutions. And before I know it, I'm wasting my life. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my money. You don't want to do that. You're tearing up relationships. You're tearing up your family. Man is not an island. The island. So everything that I do affects my family around me. And we want to be ever so careful that the things that we are doing in the body of Christ as saints of God, that we are not doing things to set other people up for failure. Because I watched my parents. They were a good example. They weren't perfect. They made mistakes, but I saw an example. So I had something to cling to. Then my daughter watched me. And as a result of that, when I, when I was married, I'm not married anymore. I'm divorced. You can still be saved and be divorced. And that's a whole nother subject. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to debunk that. There are reasons for divorce. I'm not going to go into it, but I am still safe, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes, I tried to save my marriage. Yes, I tried to do things to stay together. But sometimes you, you can only control yourself. You can't make decisions for other people. So with that being said, and whether or not my daughter was out of wedlock or not, it doesn't matter. You still can come to the Lord, even if that's your story. So understand that God loves us all, but understand that you can get things right. You want to be an example to your family around you of, of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And that's what it is to be a Christian. And just because you say I'm a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to heaven either. I mean, hey, people go to church every Sunday that are not going to make it into heaven. So make sure that you've invited Christ into your heart and that you are a follower, that you're an imitator of Christ doing the best that you can with what you know as you learn and as you grow. So if you're one of the ones that's fallen away, come back. If you're here, stay. But I was saying that Mac, Max Licato is one of my favorite authors. And When God Whispers Your Name is one of the books that I had been reading. And in that book, he used an excerpt from one of the books in my daily devotional. He said, growth is the goal of the Christian. Maturity is mandatory. So let's look at our lives. Let's look at my, I'm looking at my life. If I'm in the same place that I was a year ago, 
two years ago or even a month ago for me because I've been saved longer. I have to ever be growing. Well, there's something wrong with that. I need to have a physical or a spiritual, if you will. I need a checkup, not just from the neck up. I need a checkup from the heart up because the Lord God looks at the heart and the heart is deceitfully wicked. The Bible says, who can know it? You can't, I can't, man can't, but God can. And his word is quick. It's powerful. Hebrews talks about how it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it can siphon through all of the gunk of our lives in the Lord through his word can wash us and cleanse us because maturity is mandatory. If my child wasn't developing correctly as she grew, that is a reason for me to be concerned and you would be concerned. So if you're not growing as a Christian, if I'm not growing as a Christian, then that's reason for me to be concerned. And again, get that spiritual goal. Find somebody that you can confide in. You can't confide in everybody, but you can confide in those who are leaders that you know are following Christ to say, hey, help me. Pray with me. I need to talk with you. I'll pick this up when we come back. We'll be back in just a moment. So again, growth is the goal of the Christian. Growth is mandatory. Maturity is mandatory, but you'll grow and mature as you continue in the things of God. And we said when a Christian stops growing, help is needed, but help is there for you in the in the um the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. But again, I said, people around you, surround yourself with people who can help you when you fall, who can lead you into steps, if you will, of how to get back up. You want to make sure, do that checkup, not on your body, but on your heart, not a physical, but a spiritual. Okay. Why don't you check your habits? That's one that I give us as a suggestion. Let's start here. Let me check my habits. Are my habits lining up with the word of God? Do I look like the old man? Once I've come into a relationship with Christ, I've accepted him into my heart. Do I look like that old man? Am I going the same places that I used to go before I gave my life to the Lord? Clubbing, we're not supposed to be unless we're ministering. And some I would say, if God didn't place that on your heart, if you know you're not called to the strip club and my parents were, they were called to to man those streets and to, to witness and minister to people. But you better be sure you have a calling because crazy things happen out there. My dad, you know, would be out there ministering and, you know, he had an instance one time Our at that time, my parents church was a storefront church and the strip club was on that um was where our church was located and so one time my dad was just sitting in his office in the church meditating and studying the word and a man walked in off the street a huge man and he had a knife and, and he told my dad he was coming to kill him and my dad said and i'm kind of paraphrasing because a lot more happened my dad said but you can't you can only say that when you have the power of God and the anointing operated on the inside of you because you are speaking to those dark forces. You are speaking to demonic powers when you are bold and something rises up on the inside of you. You can feel that helper. And he said, but you can't. And the man said, I know. And I'm sure my dad ministered to him and at you know some point in time. But my dad lived years and years after that. And he had made a declaration that I won't go until I'm empty. Everything that God has placed on the inside of me, I am going to spill that over, if you will, share all of my experiences. I'm going to do everything that the Lord has called me to do. And my dad did that. I had an experience and I got a chance to see him I don't want to call it his deathbed because he was transitioning 
to life. And I saw that happen. I saw things as, you know, he was a kidney dialysis patient and all of the patient and all of the things that they said would happen to him as a result of going off of the dialysis machine. He had made up his mind. He called me in San Antonio and I was entering into the parking lot of, of the school that I taught at. And he said, baby girl, I am ready. I'm ready to go meet my savior. And when I was here watching him transitioning into life everlasting, I felt the peace of God. And before he did that, he said, you finish your race. And so I'm doing the best to my ability to finish my race, to fight the good fight of faith, because I want to see my daddy again. I want to see my sister again. Troubles don't last always. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not going to experience hard times and heartache. I sit in this chair. I had to retire due to disability. I experience pain almost every single day of my life. Intense pain. But I'm here to tell you that in that pain and the circumstances and the storms of life, I have peace. You can't have peace like that if you're not in Christ. The world's definition of peace looks like this. Well, everything in my life is going good, so I have peace. But when things in your life aren't going good, do you still have peace that surpasses all understanding when you don't know what's going on when you're saying god you feel like where are you he's there even if you can't trace him oftentimes i've talked to the lord and you can don't listen to people who tell you well you can't ask god questions well if you can't ask god who can you ask who can you turn to he always answers us it might not be the answer that you want it might not be the answer that you're looking for, but he will answer us. And sometimes we go through things that he doesn't pull us out of immediately, but he goes through with you. And I've been going through, really, I've been going through things all of my life. But just a couple of years ago, I got diagnosed, you know, with back to back issues that caused me to not be able to work a full time job and do the things that I wanted to do. And I was upset. I was asking God why, but in this, I've gotten closer to the Lord and I'm thankful for an experience. I'm not saying I'm thankful for the pain, but I'm thankful for an experience that brought me closer to God because that was my confession. Okay, I'm not going to walk away from God because there's nothing for me to go back to. I know what it looks like. I know what it feels like. You're going to experience life anyways. Experience the ups and the downs in Christ. He will be with you. Matthew 28, 20 says, God is always with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Even if you make your bed in hell, uh, figuratively speaking, he is with you and he can pull you out. Don't die and go to a place that wasn't meant for you, please. This is the cry of the Holy Spirit. This is him beckoning you. This might be your last chance. Don't close your eyes and wake up in hell. And I cry because there's a compassion and a conviction. I love people. That's what we're called to do. But I'm feeling the heartbeat of Christ. He made us in his image. I don't know who this message is going to minister to, but I'm feeling things that the Holy Spirit is allowing me to feel for a reason because of his love, because of his compassion. So start with checking your habits and make these four habits regular activities and see what happens. First, the habit of prayer. It's important. Start by talking to the Lord. Be natural. Get yourself somewhere, just you and God. Talk to him. Start your day off. Open up the word and read a scripture. Read one or two and then meditate on that. Try to walk that out in your life throughout the day. Be cognizant that the Lord is with you. Be cognizant of the fact that even if you can't verbally, wherever you are, open your mouth and pray. Pray in your conscience. The Lord hears us. He knows our thoughts. He knows the intents of the heart. So he hears you even when you can't speak. I know I've been in times, you know, November 30th or November 28th, there was an attempted break-in. And I would be lying if I told you that I wasn't afraid. 
<laughs> but I knew that God was with me and my daughter. She had come to the back and said, Mama, somebody is coming into the house. And immediately I told her, you get in the closet. And yes, I had a weapon. I, I'm, I'm a woman I, and, and I have a daughter and I'm going, we have the right as Christians to defend ourselves. So yes, I had my weapon and I picked up that weapon, but I had the weapon of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit wasn't kept about that house. I didn't know what to do at first. And so I bent down and it was like I saw feet, but they were huge. And the Holy Spirit let me know those were angels protecting you. Those were angels keeping at bay destruction and danger. So I know God is real. I'm not talking about what he's not. So I caution you. Love the Lord. Pray. Read your word. Repent. Get into a habit of knowing him. Invite him into your heart. If you haven't already, he will be your helper. He will keep you. And last of all, make a habit of fellowship, okay? Fellowship with like believers. Find somebody you can trust and confide in. And I'm going to wrap it up and say that I love you. But most of all, God loves you. So know that he loves you. Know that he cares for you. Know that he's on your side. Know that he's fighting for you, fighting with you. And when you feel like he's not there, know that he's not anywhere. He may be trying to teach you something. So ask him, help me, Lord. Help me to know what it is that you want me to learn from this situation. Okay. God bless you. I love you. Stay in relationship with Christ Jesus.